Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sohil Sood. I'm a pediatrician and I lead the Safe Schools for All team at the California Department of Public Health. And I want to welcome you all to our ongoing discussion about the crisis regarding fentanyl use among California's youth. This issue is one that hits home for many folks. Um, and with that in mind, for those joining us live, if you're comfortable doing so, I just want you to put a plus sign in the chat, not the Q&A, but the chat, for each individual you personally know who's been impacted by this. It can be a friend, a family member, a student, a colleague. Just want you know everyone on this virtual call to get human for a second and, uh, and sense how widespread this is on a personal level. Thank you for doing so. Um, and, and now let's take a, a brief look at the numbers, which corroborate what I'm seeing here in the chat is an overwhelming amount of, of folks who've been hit by this personally. Um, what, what's listed on this slide here is information from the California Overdose Surveillance Dashboard. And what I want you to take away from this is, uh, number one, that overdose deaths uh, as a result of fentanyl are increasing statewide, including in our youth, as is described here in that chart that's boxed in red. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, and number two, that you can drill down using this dashboard uh, to, to find out more information about your county and see the scale of the problem in your community. We have a few presenters uh, here today from the Sacramento region, so we've selected that county. But again, the trends are similar everywhere. Children and children in schools are overdosing, either intentionally or inadvertently, as a result of fentanyl. Uh, now, it takes a comprehensive set of approaches to address this. It takes supply-side measures to curb the, the entry of drugs into these communities. It takes demand-side measures, understanding the drivers of use, awareness that any pill purchased off the street can contain fentanyl, and that, as has recently occurred in multiple California schools, that one pill can kill. Uh, CDPH has resources to address some of these broader conversations, which our subsequent speakers will cover. But in addition to those, if we can go to the next slide, many of you have submitted your great work, including brief videos you've developed that similarly raise awareness and offer opportunities to engage in meaningful and important conversations. So we will share out these resources, but all of you on this call, please feel free to review them and contribute so we can all collectively learn and improve the situation. And with that, I will turn it over to our experts. Uh, we will start with speakers from the California Departments of Public Health and Healthcare Services, as, as June has mentioned, um, to share more information about fentanyl and naloxone, a life-saving antidote to fentanyl. Uh, then we'll transition to educational officials from throughout the state to share their experiences and perspectives, and in particular, how they've stood up naloxone programs in their school communities. So thanks again. I'll now hand it over to Robin Christensen from the Substance and Addiction Prevention Branch at the California Department of Public Health for more. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for having us back, Sohil and team. My name is Robin Christensen. I am the Chief of the Substance and Addiction Prevention Branch at the California Department of Public Health. I'm joined here today by my colleague, Jackie Tompkins, who has been working on this issue with me for the past several years. We are here to talk today about fentanyl, which is a potent and dangerous synthetic opioid. It's a topic that's become increasingly relevant to school districts with increasing rates of overdose among the teenage population, as Sohil pointed out. In the United States, drug overdose is now the third leading cause of death among those under 19. And in California, as we have been looking more closely at the data, we have looked at the ages between 10 and 19 to sort of try to understand the story behind this. And what we're seeing is that for non-fatal overdose, we are seeing emergency department visits more than tripling from 379 uh, emergency department visits to 1,222 in the year 2020. Overdose deaths have also correspondingly increased. We had opioid related overdose deaths. At one point, 2018, we recorded just 54 overdose deaths for this age range, and that had increased by 407% up to 274 deaths in 2020. This increase has been driven largely by fentanyl. Fentanyl now accounts for about 95% of opioid related overdose deaths among those ages 10 to 19 in our state. Now, to put this in context, deaths from opioid-related overdoses have increased across the entire population, not just among our youth. Uh, they've more than doubled in the general population. And this is because fentanyl is cheap, it is small, it is relatively easy to manufacture and to move. 
and it's intentionally used to replace some of the more expensive opioids, and it does also inadvertently contaminate the drug supply. Youth may be encountering it through pills obtained through social media, through friends. Um, they may be obtaining it through substances which they may never think would contain fentanyl. Now, a few years ago when our program started, I really didn't think that we would be talking to schools about fentanyl overdose, but schools are in a position to now recognize and respond to overdose and to prevent death. So signs of an opioid overdose might include an extreme or sudden inability to stay awake or alert, very slow breathing, a body might be limp, uh, cold and discolored skin. And when you recognize somebody who is in the signs of overdose, what do you do? How do you save somebody from an overdose? One of the tools that we have, the, probably the best tool in our toolkit to prevent somebody from dying from an overdose is a class of medications known as opioid antagonists. Naloxone or Narcan is the most commonly known and used opioid antagonist on the market today. And these drugs, they bind to the opioid receptors in the brain and it can actually reverse the overdose. It doesn't take very long. Naloxone takes just a few minutes to work. Naloxone is non-addictive, it's non-habit forming, it has zero side effects if there are no opioids in your system. And that's why for over 50 years now, the harm reduction community has advocated for community-wide distribution of naloxone. It is safe. It is easy to administer. There's a nasal spray and also an auto injector. And it just is one of the best tools that we have to save lives. We never ever want to have to use it, but I always encourage people like yourselves who are in the position to help to carry it or to have it on hand just in case. So we're here talking about rainbow fentanyl today, and this really is, it's fentanyl, but it is fentanyl dyed with brightly colored dyes and other types of colorants. It may be packaged as counterfeit pills. It may be in blocks that resemble sidewalk chalk. Uh, these are some pictures from recent seizures, some of which have occurred within California. We have been finding colored, uh, colored fentanyl within California. Law enforcement has started to report on some of the seizures within our state. There have been seizures within LA County, the Bay Area, and across the Central Valley, and we do know it's being trafficked. Lab testing shows that it is no different from the drug fentanyl. The coloring has no meaning. There's no difference in strengths between these colors, but it is brightly colored, and therefore it may be more visually appealing to users and to people who would inadvertently use it, not realizing that it's a substance that can kill them. Any pill, regardless of its color, shape, or size that doesn't come from a healthcare provider and is not dispensed by a pharmacist can potentially contain fentanyl and can be deadly. So if your school is interested in obtaining naloxone, your first question is probably how do you get it? And one of the ways in which the California Department of Public Health has been working to expand access to naloxone is through our statewide standing order. We maintain the statewide standing order as a way for entities to distribute or to administer naloxone to others or to individuals who are at risk of an overdose without having a specific individual prescription. Schools may determine that they're interested in having some on hand, like in a nurse's office, at a couple locations around the school, just there, just in case of an emergency or it may be more appropriate for certain schools to consider having it as a distribution point. Either process is acceptable and allowable under the statewide standing order. The process is reasonably quick and simple. There's a short form to complete. There's an agreement to a, spec a specified list of terms and conditions, and there's a free training, which is available on the standing order website, which will allow you to understand how to use naloxone in case of an emergency. And that's it. Your copy of the standing order is good for two years. It's easily downloadable. You have it available to you on your computer. I wanted to share a few quotes from our community partners about examples of times when having naloxone on hand in the community setting has really helped to save lives. For example, a, a patient with active substance use disorder was able to save a friend of hers who overdosed. A girlfriend saved her boyfriend's life. And a teenager whose life was saved twice recently, thanks to a family member, 
who had been trained to use naloxone and who had it on hand. So fentanyl is scary. Our, our program, the Overdose Prevention Initiative at the California Department of Public Health has been working to address fentanyl as well as other, other causes of overdose and working to address the overdose crisis for several years now. We do this through tracking data and trends, through building community partnerships, and through promoting policy-based solutions to the overdose crisis. One example of one of these such policies is thinking about having a district level naloxone policy. There are some examples of naloxone policies that we're aware of, but we're also, we also know very well that those of you on this webinar today probably have access to many more. And we encourage you to learn and share with one another and also with, with the Safe Schools staff. We can continue to post some of these resources on that SHARE website. We have, we work with several coalitions. We have 21 coalitions, which cover 30 counties in the state of California. Now, these are just the CDPH funded coalitions. There are other coalitions across the state as well. And I wanna just point to the local overdose prevention coalitions as a potential resource at the local level to help to support overdose and naloxone related policies in schools. Finally, there are several resources which are available on our program website, specifically targeting adult role models, including parents and teachers. So uh, information is available here, which is, let me advance to the next slide, which is probably more easily navigate, navigated to by using this link here, cdph.ca.gov backslash stop overdose for more information and some resources on how you can think through a naloxone policy and better understand naloxone and the statewide standing order. Uh, feel free to email us. Our, this, there is a woman who is manning this uh, email box as we speak. So we are looking forward to hearing from you and answering any questions you may have on the standing order. And with that, I will flip it over to Madison. Hello, everyone. My name is Madison Royer. I am with Rare Health Group. And we support uh, the Department of Healthcare Services on the administration of the Naloxone Distribution Project, which is what I am here to talk to you about today. And the Naloxone Distribution Project, or the NDP, is one way for entities in California, including schools, to obtain naloxone. And the way it works is that entities apply to the Department of Healthcare Services. And when they are approved, the naloxone is shipped directly to the entity. And we provide to schools the Narcan, the nasal spray formulation of naloxone um, manufactured by Emergent Biosolutions. So I will put our website in the chat and all of these documents and instructions that I'm going to talk about are available there, but I will just run through the process very quickly. And so the way it works is that you will fill out the NDP application, which is a two page um, PDF form. It has your organization information, um, the number of units of Narcan that you're requesting. Each unit comes with two doses, um, the address that you would like it shipped to and some contact information. You'll submit um, a copy of your standing order. So you just learned how to obtain that standing order through um, the California Department of Public Health. So make sure you submit a copy to us as well with your application. You'll submit um, a copy of a valid and active business license, FEIN or tax exempt letter. For example, that um, federal identification number can be found on like a WN. And then if you're requesting over 48 units, we ask for a distribution plan. So this might be if a school district or a county office of education is applying on behalf of the schools um, under your jurisdiction. We'll wanna see um, the justification for that amount. Maybe if you're distributing to multiple schools or sites, just listing out those schools and the number of units that you plan on distributing to each school or site. Um, if you're requesting under 48 units, we do not need to see that justification, um, but um, orders need to be made in multiples of 12. So 12, a minimum of 12, and then 24, 36, et cetera. Once you submit your application, we will confirm receipt of that within one week. Um, if you're missing any of those documents that I mentioned, we'll reach out to you to request those. And then um, once we have received all of your documents, the current processing time is about four to six weeks. Um, it's a little bit long right now, as you can imagine, we're receiving quite a large number of applications. Um, so thank you for your patience as we work through those. And then once you receive your acceptance letter, um, the naloxone will be shipped directly to the address that you've provided us, provided us within about 
one to two weeks um, directly to your site. And I can pause there and turn it over to the Washington Unified School District. I'd be happy to take any questions about the process at the end. Thank you. Hey, uh, this is Carrie Langren and Samantha Burr. We are school nurses for Washington Unified School District in West Sacramento. Um, so we wrote our tongue in cheek, a basic guide to getting Narcan for schools with several pitfalls along the way. I'm gonna start by letting you know, um, Samantha did 99% of the work. All I did was make the PowerPoint. Oh, next slide, please. Um, so Washington Unified, um, we have about 7,500 students. We have one large high school, two small high schools, seven K to eight schools, which also house uh, preschool and TK, and we have one virtual school. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, Samantha had started working on obtaining Narcan for our large high school in March of 2022. And April 19th, um, we got our first two doses delivered to that high school. Um, she trained the health aide and the substitute school nurse. Um, and yes, everybody's going to get the PowerPoints at the end. Um, she also notified the administrators as to where it was, who was trained, and how to use it. Next slide, please. Um, in May, our school board announced that Narcan was available at one of our high schools, but we didn't know they made this announcement at the meeting, so our phones are ringing off the hook the next day. Um, so just be prepared um, that somebody you don't know about might announce something, you might end up on the news. Um, just be prepared for all those phone calls coming out of the blue. Next slide, please. Um, Samantha created a report. Um, so if anybody does administer Narcan, um, you can write down what happened, um, and then we have a record of all the care that the person received. Next slide, please. Um, and then I added the Narcan training to our annual medication training, so I give that to all of our health aides, administrators, and secretaries in the fall. Next slide, please. Um, in June and July, um, we well, in June, we were discussing that we needed Narcan available at all of our in-person schools. Um, and this is because you never know who is going to be um, affected by an overdose. It could be a middle schooler experimenting. It could be a young child who got into a prescription medication of their families. It could be a community member or a parent. Anybody might overdose on campus. Um, so Samantha worked over the summer um, to find a way to get Narcan for all of our high schools and our K-8 schools. Um, in August, she found and applied for the Direct Relief Community Narcan Donation Program, and with the help of Yolo County Public Health, she was able to get two doses for each of our sites. Next slide, please. Um, and then we got our um, doses in September, and they came with a form that looks like this, um, and we're supposed to keep this form with the medication for six years, so we put that in the bag with the medications. Next slide, please. Um, and so in an emergency, we wanted it to be easily located by people who may be unfamiliar with the campus. For example, if there was a coach or a parent visiting for an after school event, um, we wanted anybody to be able to know where it was and how to get it. Um, so we put these red signs that say EpiPens and Narcan inside. We put those on the doors to the room where it's stored. We put it on the cabinet where it's stored. Um, we tried to have them as close to the AED as possible. Um, we decided to keep the Narcan in the bright yellow EpiPen boxes that we had. That way, um, it's a place that everybody in the school is familiar with. It's not locked. If, as you can see, there's like a little um, red like twist tie thing on there. So it's secure and that no little kid's gonna be messing with it, but it's not locked. So anybody can rip that open. Next slide, please. Um, and then once we got our doses at each school, the school nurses sent out um, emails to all campus staff members that we have Narcan on campus. We defined what it is, where it is, and a video link to learn how to use it. And while we do have staff who are officially trained by the nurse in Narcan administration, we wanted as many people as possible to be able to use it. That way, if it's an after school event, if the nurse, the health aide, the secretary aren't there anymore, we just wanted any staff member to be able to know how to use it in case of an emergency. 
Next slide, please. Um, and then in October, Samantha filed for additional doses of Narcan through the state California naloxone distribution program at our project. And then she applied for a second standing order. Next slide, please. Um, so our future plans um, that we're gonna add a Narcan procedure to the campus safety plan. Um, we're also going to add it to our nursing and health aid protocols. We're gonna continue to train as many staff as possible. And we're going to try to work to make reordering much smoother than the first several attempts were. Um, and then our future future plans obviously would be in drug use prevention to stop overdoses before they happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carrie and Samantha. Next up is Tommy El Matari from Elk Grove Unified School District. Tommy, are you there? I am. Thank you, June. You're welcome. I am here. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tommy El Matari. I'm the Health Service Coordinator for Elk Grove Unified School District. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over our program. We actually first started this program in 2018. Um, it was first initially approved by our cabinet and our board members in 2018, and then we rolled out the program in the 2018-2019 school year. We Currently, we have it stored at all of our middle schools and high schools and all of our alternative um, schools as well. And it is stored kind of like how Carrie was explaining in Washington. It's in the health office um, with signs pretty similar to what they were showing where it is with our EpiPen um, and Narcan signs um, in the health office um, for staff if needed. Um, and then currently who's trained on to administer Narcan in our district are our security resource officers. At the time, our school district implemented um, this program in 2018, 2019. It, the, the most challenge, the biggest challenge we had it was discussing of who would be administering and who would be trained to administer um, Narcan if needed. At that time, we had our security resource officers at each high school, which then they are only a minute or two away from their um, uh, middle schools. Um, and so it was discussed at the leadership level that the best option at that time would be to train all of our security resource officers. Um, we had Narcan at each middle and high school. Um, since we did have security resource officers at the high school stationed every day. And also all of our security resource officers also carried one in their vehicles, which they still do today. Um, so since then, there have been a little changes about that. We no longer have security resource officers at each high school. They all are more roving around um, our district. And so we are hoping and planning to make some changes to our program. Um, but when we initially started, that's how it was set up. Um, and then again, the only challenge we came across was a discussion of who to administer. Um, but now with a lot of changes going on, um, Narcan being more widely available, um, our security resource officers no longer being stationed at all of our high schools. Um, we are hoping to make some updates to our board policies and our protocols to where we will include um, pretty much staff on site who want to volunteer to be trained to administer Narcan, specifically, of course, our health service staff and then administration and office staff um, to open it up to more staff on campus. This year, we also, um, I just placed an order um, through DHCS as well to start distributing and, and have it at all of our elementary schools. Um, for Elk Grove Unified, we do have 43 elementary schools, nine high schools, nine middle schools, and then eight alternative schools. So we have um, 69 schools um, total and about 64,000 um, students in our district. So in order to get it a little bit more throughout our community, we have ordered to be to have Narcan at all of our elementary schools this year. And so because of that as well, we do wanna open this up and have more people trained on campus that are there every day. 
Um, so we also work closely. It's not only a um, partnership with for health services to run this program, but for our, um, you know, I am responsible to do the training um, and the ordering and, and that type um, and that role for our naloxone program. But our youth development office, who also oversees our drug, um, tobacco and alcohol um, prevention programs, um, is who sets up and does a lot of our um, trainings at school sites for having presenters coming in to the schools to talk to, to students and staff. Um, this year, we've already had our local um, county office, Sac County Department of Public Health, and then also in collaboration with Arrive Alive, um, came out to our schools and um, did presentations to our high school students and staff um, for um, overdose and, and naloxone and how to, you know, administer and, and treat and everything like that. So our youth development office plus health service office um, work together um, to for this program um, for our district. And, um, you know, it, it's been working really well. We haven't had many other challenges or pushback um, when implementing this in our district um, so far. So um, hopefully we get get some and we can get it out to elementary school sites um, pretty soon. And so we have had it for, for a few years, but now just making it um, a bigger program. And um, so hopefully that, that helped. Um, if anyone does have questions in the end, I could share my email if, if that's if needed. Um, but um, but basically that, that's our program in, in Elk Grove. Thank you, Tommy. That was super helpful. I think you do have a question in the chat. You might uh, be able to answer in the chat box how many doses of each school in Elk Grove. Um, thank you again. Okay, San Diego County Office of Education and Unified School District are back with us today. Thank you so much. Karina, are you there? I'm here and I will uh, share the screen. Excellent. Thank you again. And I see Dr. Taurus is with you. Also. All right. Thank you. All right, Karina, I can start. Go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Alfonso, and I'm the Program Manager of Nursing with San Diego Unified School District. Our Executive Director of Nursing um, in our district, Susan's office. Susan Barndoller, uh, presented last time, but was unable to be here today. So I'm here in, um, in her place. So we were asked by CDPH to give a brief presentation of our district naloxone program, in part because we've had one for several years. Uh, and Kareen and I were trying to figure out why we had Narcan since 2017. And we think one of the reasons um, were the powerful stories of people overdosing around the county. We are lucky to have a very motivated DEA agent in San Diego. His name is Rocky, and he has been educating us on the latest drug trends and issues for years. So Rocky can sometimes be very blunt and scary in his dialogue <laughs> and stories around illicit drug use, but these stories are very effective. Um, in part, Rocky pretty much scared us uh, into motivation to get Narcan at our sites. Um, also presenting is Corrine McCarthy. She currently is the uh, school nurse from the San Diego County Office of Education, but she used to be uh, one of our resource nurses for San Diego Unified, and she really helped bring this program to our district. And also with us is Dr. Howard Tarras. Dr. Tarras is a UCSD pediatrician and our district consulting physician um, who also contracts with many school districts around the county and the state to help bring these and other programs to our schools. So take it away, Kareen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history again is um, Kareen McCarthy from the uh, county, uh, San Diego County Office of Ed. So I was with San Diego Unified um, from 2008 till uh, uh, 2018. And in the in 2017, we were hearing lots of rumblings about Narcan, naloxone, um, the opioids on the streets. And so Howard uh, Terrace and I uh, decided to uh, do something about it. And he did the standing order for uh, naloxone. And I took the training uh, at the San Diego uh, County uh, Health and Human Services. I came back to uh, San Diego Unified, and at that point, we trained all the school police that we had, um, and they were the initial folks that had it. 
uh, in their cars, on their person, because they were at the comprehensive high schools, all of the high schools. Uh, in 2018-19, the um, naloxone distribution project uh, came about, and I can't speak highly enough about this program. Um, uh, we, we jumped over to that after doing uh, a year with uh, getting um, uh, the naloxone from the county. We jumped over to the, the uh, NDP. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it is the easiest um, uh, project. It, it's such an easy way to get your Narcan. I, I can't speak highly enough about that, how they've done that uh, for the whole state. Okay, and so yeah. How is the program operationalized uh, at San Diego Unified School District? So using the CDPH's naloxone distribution project, we order Narcan annually for all of our schools that have sixth grade students and above. The Narcan is shipped to our central, um, to our central nursing office here at the Ed Center. We distribute two boxes each to each school via the health office staff, whether it's the, our UAPs or our school nurses. Um, just like the other districts, we do house the Narcan in the health office with other unlocked emergency rescue medications. For training, we use the video from the CDPH website and the handout created by Dr. Taras with an FAQ. Our health office uh, UAPs are trained every year. We also have 3D training of other staff in case the health office staff are absent. Um, and in addition, anyone can volunteer to be trained on Narcan. And many times um, the nurse does the training. It's usually, he or she usually presents at all staff meetings. And then everyone wants, because uh, everyone wants to be trained on this. Also um, new this year is that we added an unresponsive person category in our district first aid protocols to address the urgency of giving Narcan in any responsive student or staff member. So, next slide. Um, so coming from uh, the San Diego County Office of Ed now, uh, we created in 2018 a naloxone toolkit. And in it, it's got, we've got sample board policies, sample pr uh, procedures, that sort of thing. And again, you'll get this slide deck, so you'll, you'll have a link to that. Um, I'm continuing the effort through San Diego County Office of Ed. And if you don't know, San Diego Unified um, is a very, very large district. It's um, the second largest in the state and has um, over 100 schools, 120 schools. 187. Uh, oh, I see, I even <laughs> forgot. So um, so establishing this program, uh, Jenny made it sound like it's an easy thing to do, but it's, uh, it's a huge undertaking. Um, so the other thing we have, and actually we have tomorrow establishing a free naloxone a uh, program at your, I, I train on it three or four times a year, and it actually takes you straight through the NDP project. Um, it is very simple. Um, I, the tips that I have come to find out is the, the folks that are not medically trained or in, in healthcare, keep the training very short and sweet. Um, I, I don't wanna overwhelm people um, about the fears and, and um, go into details about things. The, the uh, Naloxone program has or project has um, a really great short video that has everything that is needed and um, it's not overwhelming. Um, I when I, I I talk to people about this, I compare it to the EpiPen Pen administration because that's been around for so long. People are used to getting trained on that. They know they can give Epi and it won't hurt anybody if they don't need it and it will save a life if they do need it. The exact same thing is with Narcan. You can't hurt someone by giving it and them not needing it, but you can save a life if you give it um, and they do need it. Um, and if you have comprehensive high schools, large, large campuses, um, you know, I love the other pr presentations where the different places they're putting the Narcan is really very helpful. Um, if you have AEDs uh, throughout your school, that's another place I might recommend um, storing it if it is climate controlled and a secure um, sort of uh, place. Uh, but that will be all over your campuses as well. So it's another another place to store it. Sometimes the ball field is, you know, a mile from from the health office. So just keep that in mind. 
Okay, we are actually are running out of time. So we do have a, a story, a very powerful story to share. So I'm actually going to condense it. Um, but it was our experience um, last spring 2022, when a student was all suddenly unresponsive. And we are very lucky. And we share this story because we didn't really do things right, but we were very lucky. First of all, the student happened to be outside and it was after school and other students noticed the student was unresponsive. So the school nurse was called, called 911, got the AED, um, but did not bring the Narcan, right? Because we didn't think about that. We were, the other case we were lucky is the EMT arrived because the student was, dec um, was going bad very fast and they injected the student with Narcan um, two doses, and before they transported the student, the student was already up and talking. So on reflection, the nurse did call us here at central office, feeling bad she didn't think about Narcan, and her it's a very large campus, her, her health office way on the other side. So now it sparked a change. Now we added the unresponsive student in our first aid protocol. We're putting it up in our updates and our principal updates. We're making a um, a school board resolution to remind all board members, um, a lot of communication with our students and families, making it more available. And again, bringing the Narcan with us when we have an unresponsive student. All right, that's it. Next slide. Uh, just this is our contact information. Um, Susan Barndollar again wasn't here, but this is Jenny Alfonso. She's at San Diego um, Unified School District and she's jalfonso at sandy.net. Um, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll just add that. Um, oh, Howard! Thank originally, you. originally, you know, they needed my signature in order to get. Oh, good point. Um, the, Nar the Narcan. You don't need um, anyone's signature if you um, are using the state program, the NDP program. It's already there's a standing order. Um, I have had some requests recently because the Narcan through this program doesn't seem to be coming as quickly. Um, as uh, some schools would like. Um, in those cases, you can ask a local physician um, for a standing order. Um, um, Dr. Sud has put on um, a, um, a district website of school resources, um, the, Q, the frequently asked Q&A regarding Narcan, and that's available. If anyone needs a standing order, we can add that on there as well in case you're asking a local physician. But for the most part, the NDP program is gonna cover everything and you, um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't need any of those. Thank you so, so much for everyone's presentation and re running through today. I know we're always uh, close on timing and we, we always appreciate you sharing your information. Um, just a couple of points. Thanks for your Q and A's. Those, We'll be diving more into some questions here momentarily. Uh, now I'd like to ask Dawn Anderson, uh, president-elect of the California School Nurses of, uh, Organization, to get her candid reflections on what's been presented um, and to see if she has any questions for the panelists or wants to recap some of her experiences in Ventura a, a bit with all of us. Thanks, Dawn. Hi, thank you, Dr. Sud. Um, I, I, I think you can, you can hear me start my video. There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming to attend this very important um, session. If you coming for the second time to get more information, this is wonderful. Um, I was, as some of the other districts, an early um, adopter um, in my district going in about at 2018-19, um, adopting, adopting the policy um, in our county. And it was really because we had a very um, motivated county. We had a lot of um, efforts in our county um, for our prescription drug work group. Um, we, you know, our law enforcement all carried in our county. So um, we had a lot of movement. I think the biggest roadblock was actually, you know, getting through to administration that it was something that was really required at the time. Um, now that doesn't seem to be a roadblock or a challenge at all. You know, administrators are really moving forward um, to make sure that this is um, on campus, that we can provide the safe environment that we always want to. So um, really good information. I love how Elk Grove also incorporated the parent piece, um, making sure that parents and students are also educated. This is one of those areas that seem to um, kind of fall 
back, you know, we, we get the policies and procedures in place, and then we throw in the, oh, by the way, we're giving the locks in and the parent annual notice, which is about 20 pages long. So really making sure that our families um, are educated on this. I know at CSNO, we're redoing, we had a module for um, the locks in administration that is about seven years old. So it's in the revision stages right now, and it should be done by the end of the month. So that will be available. But um, right now, I wanted to know, does Safe Schools for All um, have any parent or um, student education materials or information that we could then also distribute? I know the bigger districts have a lot of resources, but we also have a lot of smaller districts in our state um, that don't have, you know, district offices that have this amount of resources to, to provide those trainings. Yeah, thank you for the thank question, Don. I actually uh, want to invite Robin Christensen from uh, the Substance and Addiction Prevention Branch to address that, uh, because the answer is a yes. Uh, on the website, there are a number of additional resources that I think would benefit all. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we're we're really trying our best to keep up with this changing environment. We know that, for example, there are certain resources that are available and then funding streams slow, or there are, for example, you know, we have a number of free programs where, for example, the uh, manufacturer emergent has donated supplies that are available for schools and YMCAs and other community-based organizations. But then when that runs out, we need to then turn to other resources. So I would refer people to our website where we are starting to collect a number of these resources. And we're trying to keep this as up-to-date as possible. So if folks are going to our website and they are noticing that there's something that is no longer current, please, I encourage you to notify me and my team. The options that we are aware of currently is free naloxone is available through the naloxone distribution program. And then we also have programs such as the direct from the distributor where we can get small amounts of naloxone shipped directly to schools from emergence through their um, sort of corporate good arm. Thanks, Robin, and thanks again for the question, Don. Um, at this point, I'd love to have all of our panelists uh, come on screen if they can. And uh, the question and answer session is now open. Uh, feel free to continue with the great questions that I see being put in the Q&A chat. Um, and if you'd like, you can also raise your hand um, and have your question, uh, you know, ask your question out loud. Um, and uh, we'll go through a few that I see frequently popping up in the chat, but maybe before that, um, let me just ask this entire group uh, a question about a, a recap and see if you think uh, if you think we're, we're summarizing things appropriately. But uh, you know, let's say you're uh, at a school district and thinking through the next steps of starting a program. And um, would you say this is this is kind of the right big takeaways to take away? Um, and maybe I'll ask the question. Uh, let's go to let's say San Diego first, and then we'll go around the horn. Uh, but you know, step one of what I'm hearing is really to think through a comprehensive strategy, think through what works for your community, um, and then step two is include within that uh, consideration of school-based naloxone programs, right, as one of of several steps to to thinking through how to address this crisis. Um, and for that, a, a key component uh, would be to consider applying to the statewide standing order. Um, a third step after that is to figure out the best way for you to get naloxone, uh, with the uh, naloxone distribution program being one of several routes to do that. Um, does that sound like a right takeaway in addition to, to learning from all of your peers about the nuances and the best ways logistically and operationally to go through that? Um, maybe I'll ask Jenny um, and, and Howard uh, to comment first and, and Corinne. Uh, Jenny, oh, Corinne. You I'll go. Hi, this is Corrine. Um, absolutely. Um, you have to get the board on, you know, the board policy needs to be um, uh, ahead of time. Uh, and, and then once you have that on uh, them on, on task for doing that, then you can move ahead. But standing order has to come first. And I can't reiterate what, uh, what Howard said enough was that the standing order program is so easy to get you. you and and you don't need, I think that was a roadblock for a lot of people. Who am I going to get a standing order from? And um, you don't need to worry about that anymore because you can go right on the um, application page and you get it within five minutes of putting it in, uh, putting in your information, you'll get it right back. And then you can use that to go anywhere to get your naloxone. And now I know um, 
Dr. Sood, you said that uh, I have gotten questions uh, for a month now. What about the elementary schools? And now you said that that is uh, something that we can do. Just put it under the, uh, it says under the NDP. Um, did I say that? Yeah. Uh, is that, it still says middle and high schools, um, but you can just put your elementary schools in there. So I don't know that I answered the question right, but I wanted to get that elementary school in there because I've had tons of, of people asking about that. They want them in all the schools now. I'll, I'll be quiet now. No, th thank you uh, for that important comment. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Tammy, and anything else, or Tommy, anything else you would add from your perspective? No, I mean, I think those are just, just the overall main steps to take. And, and just like everyone's saying now with the standing order, that made it very nice and easy. Um, we got ours previously from our local county office, but um, now with CDPH and all that program, that's that's great. So it makes it a lot easier access. Thanks. Appreciate that. Carrie and Samantha? I would uh, tend to agree. We have had a neighboring district that I spoke with um, still in Yolo County, and she was having struggles getting uh, the orders filled. I think that's because we're a little late to the party, right? You guys all started it before everyone else was trying to get it. So it's taking us a little bit longer to get our doses. Um, but she did take the standing order that you can get on the CDPH to a local pharmacy and was able to get some doses for her school that way. So it has made it easier. And what's nice is that it's very similar to the epinephrine program in that you always have to decide where you're going to keep it, who's going to be trained to give it, how will everyone know that's where it's kept and who's trained. And so because almost every school district is already has epinephrine online, once you have the standing order and once you have the once you have it in your schools, it's really following a lot of the same protocols that you're used to. Yeah, great. Um, I think that's a very fair analogy. So, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, let's talk a little bit more about training, seeing a fair number of questions come up in the, the Q&A about training. Maybe I'll start with you, Robin. Can you describe some of the CDPH resources around a training for use of naloxone? And then um, we'll, we'll go to Don and maybe Tommy to describe any additional training efforts that, that uh, were provided in addition to perhaps some CDPH materials. Yeah, absolutely. So on the on our website, we do have a link to an 11 minute training video, which walks a person through naloxone and the steps that are, are needed in order to administer the nasal spray of naloxone. So it is an 11 minute, we tried to keep it concise and have just the information that's needed in order to understand how to administer naloxone. And this training meets the requirements for participating in the statewide standing order. So it is a video training. It is easily accessible. It's available through our website. It is also somewhere on YouTube. And uh, I think we can, I think somebody has just dropped the link in the chat for me already. So it, it is there so you folks can see how, just how easy it is to administer and how, how, how easy it is to take the training to learn how to administer. It's, it's similar to my Flonase that I use every single morning. Um, so I, I just, I wanna remove the barriers as much as possible when it comes to this. Now there is also an auto injector form of naloxone. So CDPH is now at the, in the process of exploring other training opportunities for how to administer uh, the auto injector version of that. So stay tuned. Thank you, Robin. Um, curious from uh, you know the school perspective, uh, Don. Uh, you know, as as you were standing up naloxone programs, um, were there? Uh, did you use the CDPH video? Did you use uh, any other materials? And how do you think about ongoing training um, in, in terms of cycles and making sure that all staff are prepared to use this in the event of an emergency? I, I love that there's a video now, you know, initially at the onset, there wasn't videos, there wasn't DHFCS. So, you know, we relied heavily on our local um, community agencies, our behavioral health substance use division um, had already had a contract with a group that um, was providing trainings for us. So they continue to support us. We have a very active no OD program um, in our county. And so they have trainers. So those trainers go out and they've trained our law enforcement they're training at our schools. And I had originally had set up 
um, for all school districts to come together. And we did a training back in, I think it was 2018, so that the nurses could feel comfortable. So I would encourage any districts, most districts, and you saw the slide about the coalitions within those counties. Um, Ventura County wasn't mentioned, but we have a very, very active coalition um, going on. I don't know if it's connected to you, but that um, reach out to your counties. We also have um, received um, naloxone from our Medi-Cal managed um, Gold Coast um, healthcare plan. So they were able to um, also get some um, naloxone that could also be um, used for um, distribution for our school. So really reaching out to them, especially if there's a back order currently, um, that your local agencies also have a stock of them that they may be able to provide. And so that's that's what we've been doing. We're working with um, Given Hour, and she's um, our trainer's actually on the line today. So um, I'm going to call up Ashley Nettles, who's one of our experts in our county, um, who's done training for every all seven law enforcement agencies, um, has spoken at national conferences, um, and she's the one who's going to be coming and doing the nurses train the trainer for us. So that way, people will feel more comfortable um, being able to have that information. Um, we will be using the video. Um, that they provided. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Kareen, is there anything you, you'd like to add to that? Two seconds. I would recommend that you send out that video quarterly to people um, because it will refresh their memory and take away uh, more and more fear. You know, like it, every three months you send it out, you say, I know you were trained. Here's a reminder. Please take 11 minutes to to watch it again, and then it is fresh in their mind. So that's what I do. Thanks, Kareem. Uh, Tommy, anything you'd like to add from the perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's all. I I do think, and I think someone said this in the chat earlier. Um, also, just a reminder per ed code there are specific topics too you have to hit during these trainings, and I think one of them is. Um, um, even like CPR and rescue breathing and then how to contact EMS. So I think there are these four topics you have to um, remember to include, not just how to administer um, naloxone. Um, but otherwise, yeah, all these resources have been great. We also have used um, like, I think it's called Operation Prevention. I think that's actually a program through DEA and working with discovery and stuff like that. So um, a lot of good resources out there too um, that help with training videos and training material as well. Thank you, Tommy. Um, Madison, some questions have come in really about the medication itself, about naloxone. So wondering if you can describe a little bit of, um, first we'll start with some questions that I've seen around um, the dosing. So is there a child dose, an adult dose? Is there any weight-based dosing or any considerations around that? Um, and then a second question around uh, the uh, shelf life of, of the, the medication. How long does it last? When do you need to think about reordering? Um, any comments on any of that? Sure. So the Narcan nasal spray is four milligrams per spray. And there's not really a way to cut the dose of that. You just push the plunger and it all goes in. And I don't believe there is guidance on um, a pediatric dose versus an adult dose, but someone with a medical degree, it feel free to jump in if I have that incorrect, but that is my understanding. Um, and then if there are additional doses needed, you wait the two to three minutes and then each unit or carton that you receive comes with those two plungers. So you give the initial first dose and then if the person is not responsive, you can give the second one. Um, in terms of shelf life, it is now three years instead of two years and the expiration date will be printed on each carton. So you can um, find that right on each unit of Narcan. It should be about three years um, and then you can contact Emergent Biosolutions directly for information on how to dispose of it. And then you can just reapply to NDP or obtain more doses um, when it is expired. Great, thank you, Madison. Uh, well, we are nearing the, uh, the top of the hour. And so uh, maybe I'll just uh, close with a question uh, for our school partners. Um, and, and that is that uh, at the top of the hour, we, we described that um, naloxone-based programs are but one of a comprehensive response, right, to this uh, overwhelming and unfortunately ongoing crisis. 
Um, so uh, in addition to uh, naloxone programs, what would you say is one particular tool that you have found really helpful or impactful uh, when thinking through an overall set of strategies to address this, you know, be that peer-to-peer -peer counseling or thinking about wellness or, or any programs around raising awareness around this that, that you would recommend to others on this call? Um, and maybe we'll start with Jenny. Well, I, I really think that everyone in general um, gets to feel that you're not alone. There's a lot of resources out there. Like Corrine had mentioned earlier, we are a very school, big, large school district. And so truly the toolkit that Corrine has done for us has been optimal. I think developing uh, partnerships with community agencies that deal with mental health, substance abuse, um, that if schools have these partnerships in place, um, that um, it becomes much easier to make referrals. Um, uh, you can um, get preventative messages into schools um, and uh, consider it uh, as part of your other general education. Um, most school districts that use Medi-Cal and have a lot of kids on free and reduced lunch must have wellness committees and making sure that this is one of the items um you know abuse of substances um um that um your wellness committee is considering um would be another way to um to do some preventive work we're having trouble getting into the future thank you howard um carrie and samantha so it's kind of a little off tangent but i i do think having your parents um buy-in and your school board buy-in because i think a lot of times people see that we're creating the problem, like, oh, we don't need that there. This isn't a problem here. You're going to make it a problem by having the solution available. So um, you have to get the buy-in and, and teach the families in the community that, you know, it's a, it's a silent problem, but it's a problem and, and get that buy-in there to help. Yeah, wise words. Um, Dawn for Ventura. You know, I, I think everyone covered it pretty well. Um, I think making sure that we have the resources available to refer students to, and really what um, Samantha just said, you know, looking at that stigma, you know, we have the, we have a high, heightened stigma about substance use um, and not harm prevention and using this as a preventative, just like we have our EpiPens, you know, we have more overdoses um, at schools than we do students needing an EpiPen due to a peanut allergy or a bee sting. Um, and it would, it's almost ridiculous not to have this available to be able to ensure that safe environment that parents want. Great, well, um, thank you all again for uh, your, your participation in this very important conversation. Uh, to those in the audience, thanks Thanks for being here as well. We will do our best to uh, turn around and get, get these materials uh, online and, and to you as fast as possible so that you can continue to share uh, this information. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn to Robin Christensen for any last words. And uh, should people have more questions about um, programs that are run by the California Department of Public Health, um, where, where should they turn to, to to ask some of those questions? Oh, well, thank you for the opportunity to end. Yes, questions go to opi at cdph.ca.gov. And I guess in closing, I would like to say thank you. And I really appreciate learning from all of the schools and, and my, my new colleagues on this call. This is a new area for us, unfortunately. And we are learning from you and we hope to continue to build bridges with our schools and build stronger partnerships. So um, yeah, thank you for having us. All right, well, thank you again, everybody. Have a great afternoon, take care.